Good morning, hello. Welcome to our first ever Organic Seed Alliance virtual field tour. Um, we're here at the Organic Seed Alliance Research Farm in Chimicum, Washington. This is a Northwest site of some of our research and education programs. We are a national nonprofit and also have projects on the ground in several states across the country. Our mission is advancing ethical seed solutions to meet food and farming needs in a changing world. Um, out here at the research farm in Washington, we conduct plant breeding projects, variety trials, some seed production increases on our research projects. Most importantly, this is a site where we normally bring together farmers, eaters, and other seed stakeholders to talk about seed, to talk about local food resiliency, and how our research and education can help build a more resilient seed and food system. This time of year, we normally invite you out for a field tour and a taste test of our crops from this year. Um, this year, we're going to bring it to you live on Instagram as best we're able through a virtual field tour. So today's crops, each day this week, we'll be meeting at 10 a.m. Today's crops we're going to talk about are our sweet corn breeding work and some dry corn trials, uh, tortilla corn type trials. So our corn breeding work is a project of NOVIC, a collaboration, uh, the, the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative, partnering with Oregon State University, University of Wisconsin, Cornell, and Colorado State University. And each of these institutions work together to address local farmers' needs and also collaborate to evaluate how our varieties grow in different areas of the country and share our breeding material with each other. So the sweet corn breeding work um, is a partnership with Bill Tracy, University of Wisconsin, public sweet corn breeder, and my colleague Lori McKenzie is going to share a little bit more about the sweet corn project. I'm Michaela Colley, Program Director, Organic Seed Alliance, and here's Lori. Hi everybody. So here in the Pacific Northwest, especially real close to the coast as we are here in Chimicum, we are a little challenged to grow sweet corn. We have a relatively cool season here. Uh, we just don't get a whole lot of heat units. We are just now enjoying our sweet corn. Uh, we started harvesting these ears about two weeks ago for our evaluations. But we get sweet corn kind of late in the year, so one of our main breeding efforts is to breed something that's a short season corn. There are a couple different kinds of sweet corn. It's, it's, um, the different kinds are related to how the sugar and starch production works. This kind is called a sugary enhancer corn, which is a corn that you can direct seed. The more sugar content you get and the less starch content you get, in the kernels, the harder it is for it to germinate if it's cool and um, wet, like we have conditions here in the spring. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the qualities we're looking for. Uh, let's start with some of these ears over here that still have their husks on. One of the most important pest issues in organic management is um, corn earworm. We don't see a lot of it here on the peninsula, but we also want this corn to be useful and productive and valuable for farmers across the U.S. So we're looking to breed a lot of husk coverage. So if I bend the top of the husk here, this is where the top of the ear is. And see how I've got like a couple inches right here. And this is nice and tight around the end of that ear. Same here. You know, we've got lots of nice um, flag leaves. They look really healthy. Lots of nice coverage there. So that just makes it physically difficult for the earworms to get down in there. Unlike these, granted these are a little farther along in maturity and they've already gotten some pest damage, um, probably mostly from birds, but you can see that they're just, there really isn't that extra husk coverage over the end of the ear. So it's easier for predators to get in there. And um, birds, raccoons, earwigs, Lots of things like to get in there and eat that sweet corn, just like we do. So we don't like these ears. We do like these ears. So when we go through our breeding plots, we go through and we just do this. 
I go through and I bend the tops and we take a rating on um, how much top coverage we have in those husks. So let's move on to the ears. There's a couple things about ears that we're looking for. You can see we have both white and yellow kernels in this population. Um, behind me is the population. There's 216 plots in there of uh, various genetic families that we go through. We look at each plot and we look at ears in each plot. And if the ears look good and the plants look healthy, then we mark that down, we give it good ratings and we'll go back and we'll continue on with that genetic material. So this is a fabulous looking ear. It's a little bit small, but that's okay because we're, we're towards the end of our productive time here. But there are several things we like about this. We like that there's nice straight rows and um, you know the kernels are nice and uniform we don't have a lot of sort of wonky kernels like this and we've got really great tip fill on the end and that means that the kernels are productive and full all the way up to the end of that ear and you can see a spectrum um, i think that is both a genetic and environmental response but anything that is genetic when we select for it we can increase and continue that trait forward in the population. So if we were to select these ears and keep seed from these ears, we would be partially selecting for this lack of tip fill and we don't want to move forward with that. We want nice, big, beautiful ears with delicious kernels all the way up to the end. So we're also looking at ear shape. Another thing I like about this ear is it's nice and fat, kind of all the way to the end of the ear. I'm not getting a lot of pointiness at the end and I'm not getting a sort of a conical shape. So here's an example of a conical shape where you've got a fat end here and it just tapers to something really skinny. So it's another thing I don't like about that ear. So when we find the ears that we like, let's say these are two of my favorites in this array right here. Um, something that's neat about corn and is not true for many crops, corn has something called the Xenia effect, which means you can see the effect of cross-pollination in the same generation that the cross is happening. So yellow kernels are dominant to white kernels. So this ear, if there were no yellow corns anywhere nearby, probably would have been all white. But because we have yellow corn in the population as well, the pollen from an ear like this, or even another ear that maybe has both white and yellow kernels, may have landed on the silks and pollinated and fertilized some of the kernels on this ear. So anything that's yellow would have been pollinated and fertilized by another corn that was yellow. Something that's really pretty awesome about corn is that the silk, every single silk, so this is what the silks look like when they have gotten pollinated and the ears gotten mature. I'll take those off just so it's a little easier to see. So every single one of these silks is attached to one single kernel of corn. So every kernel of corn on here has its very own silk. And I'm gonna try and open this so you can see it. It's a little easier to show that when the ears are really young. Oh, Michaela's got a great uh, example right here. And you can see it here as well, where you see those silks coming all the way down to each single kernel. So every kernel on here could have a different source of pollen that landed on the end of the silk. It has to grow all the way down that pistil. silk, which is the, the pistil, and fertilize the ovary in order to make a full kernel. And so this is actually a good example of, see how there's some blanks here? So these kernels, the silks never got pollinated. Or maybe they got pollinated and then it got cold at night and the pollen wasn't able to grow because it got too cold and it aborted. So it never managed to grow all the way down to where these kernels would have been. Um, another thing that's fun to note on this ear here, see how some of these kernels are a little bit darker and they're almost kind of an orangey pink color. Here we actually have one that looks like it might have gotten some blue pollen. And that could have come from our dry corn trial, which we're gonna go look at in just a moment. So I think that most of this color change is actually due to the maturity of these kernels. They're starting to dry down. Um, this is past where you would want to eat it. If you see these colored corn, colored kernels in an orange or a pink, um, 
that can mean that it's it's really past the, the prime eating stage. So those are the qualities that we're looking for in the ears. And now Michaela is gonna step into the field with you all and show you some of the qualities we're looking for on the plants. Laura, you forgot one important trait. Oh no, what is it? Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> we have to taste them. So anytime we find a plot that's got nice stalks, nice plants, it looks healthy, um, the ears are big and fat and full, what do we do? We taste it. That's pretty good. A couple things we're looking for here. We're looking for nice deep kernels. So we want a lot of like great mouthfeel. You want to get a whole nice hefty bite. Sometimes the kernels are really shallow and that's just not a very pleasant eating experience. So we're looking for something that has a nice crisp texture. It's got both sugar and corny flavor. Um, we're looking for the maturity. These are actually a little bit late maturing. The ears that we're going to select for continuing forward with the breeding work would have actually been prime mature about two weeks ago. So we need that earlier maturity. These are later ears that um, are still great for eating, but we're not going to move forward with in the breeding work. So let's go see what Michaela has to say. So of course we want a good quality ear. That is one of the primary traits that we're looking for in breeding, but we also want healthy plants that stand up out in the field. So every plot in the field is evaluated for disease and rated for how much disease we see or don't see on the plants. Um, these corns were already harvested previously. It's a little late in the season now, uh, but one of the, the uh, disease qualities we look for is this stripe rust that you can see on this leaf here. So we'll evaluate all of the plot for disease and give it a good rating. Um, we also look for stalk strength. If we see something tending to lodge and fall over really easily, that's not a desirable trait. This one feels pretty sturdy. Uh, we also make notes on whether or not you see tillering, which is these side shoots starting to come off the bottom of the plant, especially if it makes this funny looking ear on a, a tiller. That is undesirable and that's a trait that you can start to see if you have too much inbreeding in a population. So as Lori mentioned, we have 216 plots out here. Each of those plots is a cross, an individual cross that was, um, that, that created a unique new combination. And then you're seeing the offspring from that cross. We take notes on each plot. We pick the best ones. We write down which numbers of plots those were, and then we share that information with our breeding partner, Bill Tracy at University of Wisconsin. He then goes to the remnant seed of that cross and sends that seed to Argentina where he has a winter breeding nursery. In Argentina next winter, each of those winners will be crossed with each other and we'll get at least 200 new crosses back to evaluate again next year. In this way, we're able to make more progress in breeding a new population by evaluating it under the environment where we're intending to grow it and then making those recombination crosses uh, in the winter time so we can keep doing that process every year. Let's uh, take a look now at our dry corn trials. Another project of Novik and a very related but different crop. Okay, so along the way, we're just going to point out a few things around the farm. And we're going to remind you that each day we're going to focus on a new crop. So tomorrow we're going to be looking at buckwheat and quinoa. And then on Wednesday, we're going to go into the greenhouse and we're going to talk about our tomato breeding and tomato trial work. Thursday is going to be all about brassicas. This is our brassica field. We've got cabbage, we've got purple spreading broccoli, we have collards, and these beautiful purple flowers that you see in between is a crop called Facelia. This is a crop that we use a lot as both a cover crop and a pollinator attractant. It's great for attracting uh, surfid flies. 
and other predatory pollinators that come in and help with aphid control. They're great at laying eggs on aphids and then they hatch out and they eat a bunch of aphids. And we have a challenge with aphids here in the field. They love brassicas. So let's even go over to one of these uh, Facilia plants just for a second. And we'll look at how many different pollinators are on it. We do have honeybees that we keep here on the farm, which help us manage uh, really robust pollination. But oftentimes when we come and we just sit and kind of check out what's going on in the Phacelia, we not only see a lot of honeybees, but we often see bumblebees. We see some others, actually see several bumblebees across the way over there. We also will see native bees and usually a really great diversity of, of pollinators and, and insect friends that help with our management and um, just help with maintaining ecological robustness and integrity here in the field, in the research field. And over here you see our carrot cages. These, uh, we'll talk about these on Friday. Friday is all about carrots. And we'll be talking about our breeding work. We'll be talking about our seed production. We'll be talking about our trialing work. We use these pollination isolation cages to maintain our breeding population so that they don't cross with each other. We've got purple carrots, red carrots, orange carrots, yellow carrots, purple orange carrots, and we don't want them to cross with each other. They're, they're very strongly cross-pollinated crop and we wanna keep those populations separate because we're trying to increase and maintain certain qualities uh, in those crops. This is Malcolm. He's our farm dog. He's also our farm mascot. Malcolm. Malcolm reminds us that it's important to stop and take breaks and take care of each other and give lots of loves. He's also important for pest control. Another thing to point out here in the field, you see this, this brown flower crop with all of these posts in it. This is actually our neighbor, Essential Blooms, who produces organic flower seeds. These are sweet peas. And with the COVID crisis this year and the increase in gardening and seed saving and food and flower production that everybody has been really excited about, uh, Essential Blooms needed a little more space they got requests for so much more seed than they usually produce that um, they're using a little bit of our field space this year, which has been really lovely to have uh, a bunch of flowers right in the middle of our field. So here we are at our dry corn trial, and I'm gonna hand it over to Michaela and Katie, and they're gonna tell you about uh, the trial goals and some of the work that we have been doing with local farmers to find a dry corn variety that will produce really well here and result in making some really excellent tortillas. All right, thank you, Lori. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I, earlier, I introduced Lori McKenzie, our Northwest Research and Education Specialist. I'm joined here with Katie Miller. Katie is our uh, research field assistant. She manages a lot of these variety trials in the field and also does a lot of work to uh, communicate with seed companies and farmers in picking which varieties go into the trials. Very important step of the trial process. So as I mentioned earlier, this dry corn trial is a project of NOVIC, Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. This is the second year that we've been conducting dry corn trials with a focus on finding varieties that will grow in our climate and make high quality tortillas. A lot of our, uh, well, all of our uh, research, all of our breeding and trials is very farmer driven. So every winter we bring the farmers together, have a meeting about how the trials went the year before and what they want to see happen the next year. A couple of years ago when we met in the winter, um, we uh, were joined by our partners up at Viva Farms up in Skagit Valley. 
Uh, Viva Farms is an incubator for over 70 farm businesses, including several uh, farmers who are immigrant farmers from Oaxaca. And our partners at Viva said that the farmers there were looking for tortilla corns that they could grow to make tortillas here in the Northwest. So these trials are being conducted on farms, including our uh, Oaxacan uh, farming partners at Viva, and also out here at the research uh, station at the Organic Seed Alliance Research Farm, excuse me. So uh, one of the challenges with producing tortilla types of corn in our climate is not only that we have a short season, just like with our sweet corn, consider the fact for tortilla corn, for flower corns, it has to go through not only that fresh eating phase, but also dry down to mature hard um, storage seed, right? The other challenge is that a lot of corn, uh, well, all of corn is uh, the birthplace of corn, the center of origin of corn, is Oaxaca, Mexico. And it's a crop that has been adapted to that climate over millennia. And um, so the day length in Oaxaca is much shorter in the middle of the summer than it is here in the Northwest. And corn is a crop that is day length sensitive. So there are short day corns that won't begin producing an ear and maturing until the length of the day of the, the sunlight during a day um, reaches a critical short enough uh, uh, window of time. So by that point in time in our climate, we're heading into the fall and a lot of corns will just start making an ear and never get a chance to finish maturing. So as I mentioned, this is year two of the dry corn trials and we have varieties included in the trials this year from local seed companies. We started first by asking our regional uh, seed growers what varieties they had experience and success with. Um, this year we also added a number of varieties from the National Plant Germplasm Repository System and uh, additionally we have some varieties from our friend Walter Goldstein, independent breeder at the Mandaman Institute. I'm going to turn it over to Katie to share a little more information about the varieties themselves, some of the results from last year, and uh, some early harvest from this year. Hi. I just harvested a handful of ears. Uh, it's mid-September. It's mid-September, so I'll talk louder. Um, and Painted Mountain reliably has come in early every year. Um, the way that we know that it's time to harvest the ear is that the husk has completely dried down and turned brown. Pull them off of, and the, the ears mature gradually over time, so we'll, we'll come through and harvest three or four times each week, or three or four weeks. Um, Painted Mountain reliably early. In our tortilla taste tests, it also made a delicious tortilla, but because it's a multicolored variety, the effect was brown, a sort of muddled brown tortilla. Not as visually appealing, but still delicious and reliably early. It also dries down. It has a very thin um, hull or cob. It has a thin cob, which doesn't hold moisture as much as a thicker, thicker cob would. The Oaxacan green has a pretty thick cob. Um, which is important for drying down. We're going to hang these up in our greenhouse to get them to dry. In drier climates, you could leave them on the plant and they would dry down in the field, but we can't do that here. Um, so here are a few varieties from last year's trials. We have Cascade Ruby Gold from Carol Deppy, Painted Mountain, uh, originally bred by, by Dave Christensen, grown at Nash's for the last many years. I don't know how many. Uh, Bear Island Flint. We were given this by Reed Aubin, the Spanish teacher at the Port Townsend High School. He also helped us with our preliminary taste evaluations. We had a really fun time. Um, his students nixtamalized, ground, cooked tortillas, and then tasted them all. We have the taste results from oh, 50 to 100 high school students in Port Townsend. Um, Oaxacan Green Dent 
from Resilient Seeds in Bellingham. This was one that Nalita, one of the farmers that we're working with in Skagit, and Misael and Salvador, they would look at the plant and they would say, oh, that looks, that looks like what we're familiar with from Oaxaca. Um, but when we came to the taste evaluations, it, they, they didn't like the flavor as much as the Knotstein and the Jerry Peterson Blue. Uh, Knotstein, this is a dent corn, also from Resilient Seeds in Bellingham, makes really beautiful yellow tortillas that are tasty. Um, and the winner of the taste test was the Jerry Peterson Blue. Everyone loved the flavor and the color of the tortillas. It made a really beautiful bright blue tortilla. Um, the Jerry Peterson Blue does not mature very early in our climate. Um, we just barely were able to get mature cobs before it started raining so much that everything was molding in the field. So this year we decided to make some crosses between the Nothstein and the Jerry Peterson Blue in the hopes that we could maintain the good tortilla quality of the Nothstein and the Jerry Peterson, introduce the earliness of the Nothstein and maybe the dent quality of it also and have hopefully an early maturing blue tortilla corn. We also just harvested a couple other varieties from our trials this year. This is Painted Mountain from Wild Mountain Farm in Colorado, uh, also very early. This is Saskatchewan White from the PI collection, the what is it, Plant Introduction Collection. Uh, the Grin Seed Repository in Ames, Iowa. And this is Northwestern Red Dent, also from the PI collection. The plants, the Saskatchewan white plants were teeny tiny. They were only, you know, two to three feet tall, but they matured very early. <laughs> I don't know if that's one that we'll continue with. The Northwestern Red, the plants were a little bit more robust. As I mentioned earlier, um, the evaluation process uh, was done in partnership with our farmer friends up at Viva Farm in Skagit Valley. Um, we really leaned on them for the history and, and familiarity and cultural knowledge about tortilla making. And in particular, we worked very closely with Nalita from Pure, from Pure Nalita Organic Farm in Skagit. Nalita is a native of Oaxaca and uh, she helped guide the evaluation from how we nixtamalized and how we evaluated the stickiness of the masa after the, nixt after the grinding and nixtamalization. She also led all of the tortilla making. And then, uh, this is pre-COVID of course, we all got together and had a big taste test and evaluated them all together. As Katie mentioned, at the end of the day, um, Jerry Peterson was a winner, but it was a little bit late and we also like the taste of Nostine, and Nostine was much earlier, had a higher yield, dried down much more easily. Uh, we also liked the look of the Oaxaca green dent. So this year we made a few crosses out in the field. Um, this happened earlier this spring. The basic process is that the tassels on one variety are crossed with the silks on, a, on the other variety, and we tried to make those crosses both directions. One of the challenges in making cross pollinations with corn is the timing of the pollen release and the timing of the receptivity of the silks. So the way that it's done is when you see a tassel shedding pollen, this one is passed and you don't see much of that dry dusty pollen falling anymore, but when it was shedding, we would put a bag over the top of the tassel, clip it with a bag over it, and leave it for a day um, in order to capture that pollen. We would then go to a second variety that had an ear just beginning to show so the shoot. Is there one by Katie? Yes. No, behind you, I think. Yeah. So what we were looking for is one that did not have the silks poking out yet, because once those silks are coming out, it's already uh, exposed to potential pollen and pollination from another plant in the field. So we would look for something more like this that doesn't have the silk showing yet. And at that point in time, before the silks emerge, 
we would take a shoot bag and we would cover it just like that. And then we would leave it out there and in a couple of days, come back and monitor those shoot bags and wait until we came out and saw those silks starting to emerge. And again, at that point in time, it might look even less emerged than this, uh, but it would have, like this one down here is a better example. So if I came back and this shoot bag was lifted and I could see those silks just starting to come out, what I would do at that point is trim them off and then come back the following day. And that following day, you would have just like a little paintbrush of silk sticking out the end of the, of the cob. And at that point in time, I would go back to my patch of the different type of corn and take that bag covering the tassel. I would knock the pollen into the bag, take the bag off. So I now have a bag of imaginary bag of pollen in my hand here. And I'd walk back to this ear that I wanted to cross and I would lift that shoot bag off, put the pollen bag over it, shake it around to get that pollination to happen. And then I would have tied that bag around it to keep the silks from receiving pollen from anything else until the ear uh, cob uh, starts to mature. So we did that um, as much as we could, trying to cross Jerry Peterson to Nostine, Nostine to Jerry Peterson, Nostine to Oaxacan Green and vice versa. And at the end of the season, we'll see if we got some cross pollination or not. We'll be able to tell if we were successful when we look at the ear of Nostine because the yellow white color is recessive to the blue or the green. So if we have some success there, we'll be able to see some blue kernels showing up. We won't be able to tell with the other direction because that blue is dominant and we'll have to wait until we look at them next year. Here's an example of one that probably got a little cross pollination last year. There's another one there. That's what you'll see. So beginning of a new breeding project, we're excited to continue working uh, with our local farmers and seeing if we can develop a variety that is unique to the Northwest and bring local tortillas to our local food system. Thank you. We look forward to joining you again tomorrow when we're going to talk about quinoa and buckwheat. Bye everyone. Have a great day. Bye.